So elastic connective tissue. <clears throat> now, I've, I know I've already mentioned elastic fibers as a part of other connective tissues, like the elastic fibers that you find in the loose areolar or connective tissue. But you can also find just elastic fibers embedded within other tissues or of organs, right? So this is actually a large artery, right? This would be a large artery. Uh, so it's a blood vessel, and all this would be smooth muscle. But right here, you can see that dark, it looks kind of like a little coiled hair, right? All of this dark staining black stuff, that's an, that's an elastic, that's elastic tissue. Over here, all of this, this is all elastic tissue as well. So um, you don't have to identify this on a slide. I just want to make you aware that you can also find elastic uh, connective tissue or elastic fibers a part of other organs. So, you know, if you talk about large arteries, they have to withstand lots of pressure from the blood that's pulsing through it. So they have to be able to expand when blood is present and then recoil to its original size so that it can propel blood forward. Okay, so this is connective tissue as a part of a, a separate organ, another, another t in, embedded within another tissue. Hyaline cartilage. So the cartilage is a uh, highly specialized form of connective tissue. So hyaline cartilage, uh, when you look at hyaline cartilage, I think it looks like if you've ever seen the cereal, the Smacks cereal, you know, with the little frog on the box, maybe too old of a reference now, but it looks like a little Smacks cereal. So hyaline, it's very glassy in appearance. And so when you go in and out of fine focus, like you can really see the glassiness of this hyaline cartilage. Um, so hyaline cartilage would be the specific, connective tissue is the general. These, so these little guys, the smacks, right? Inside, that, those are chondrocytes, right? Those are the cells that produce the abundant extracellular matrix. And when those chondrocytes produce all of this abundant ground substance, they end up getting enclosed within this space called a lacunae. So this space that surrounds the cell is its lacunae or house, right? So they actually get enclosed within their own ground substance. Now, um, cartilage, so if you see on the periphery, I'll, I'll go ahead and mention this because it will help in your lecture when you get to tissues, but this tissue that's around the periphery of the hyaline cartilage, this is called perichondrium, and the perichondrium is a mixture between loose and dense connective tissue, but it's very highly vascularized because if you look in this hyaline cartilage, it's actually not vascularized. There are no blood vessels running through the cartilage itself, but there are blood vessels in the connective tissue that surrounds the hyaline cartilage. So these cells have to rely on diffusion through this semi-rigid, semi-solid ground substance. So we have to get diffusion of nutrients from this perichondrium through this ground substance and to the cells. So hyaline cartilage is actually very difficult to heal, right? So if you uh, injure a hyaline cartilage, it takes a really long, or if you, if you injure any cartilage, it takes a long time for healing to happen because of that very slow diffusion of nutrients through this semi-rigid, semi-solid ground substance, okay? But the that ground substance makes pretty much carries out the, the functions of the hyaline cartilage. So where do you find hyaline cartilage? You find hyaline cartilage connecting the ribs to the sternum. You find hyaline cartilage in the trachea. There are rings of hyaline cartilage in your trachea or your windpipe. And so think of like your ribs connecting to your sternum through hyaline cartilage or costal cartilage. Sometimes it's referred to costals referring to ribs. Your rib cage has to be really protective, so it has to be able to withstand compressive forces, right? Because you want to protect those delicate internal organs like your heart and lungs. But you also want to be able to have a little bit of expansion because when you take a really deep breath in, what happens? Your rib cage expands. If it was if your ribs connected to your sternum directly, bone to bone, there would be no give, right? Your your um your rib cage would not be able to expand, okay? But we still want to be really protective and resist compressive forces, so that's why we have hyaline cartilage connecting your ribs to your sternum, okay? So it gives some give, right, 
but still very protective and, you know, uh, somewhat rigid so that it can still protect the organs below. Okay, but it does have a little bit of flexibility to it. Hyaline cartilage in the trachea. So your windpipe, right? Uh, the organ that is directly behind your trachea is your esophagus. And your esophagus has to be able to expand sometimes great uh, diameters to allow food to pass through the esophagus to get to the stomach. Well, your trachea is right in front of your esophagus. So if, you know, having this hyaline cartilage, it keeps the, um, it keeps the windpipe open, right? And it's protective of the windpipe, but it also has some give to it as well, if that makes sense. Some flexibility, some, okay? Slight, very slight flexibility. So this is another image of hyaline cartilage, and this is why you can't always learn by color or stain, because the stains can vary, the colors can vary, but the structure is not, right? Here's our chondrocytes in their little lacunae, and if we were to be able to go in and out of fine focus, this extracellular ground substance would be very, very glassy in appearance. On the outside, this is that... Uh, connective tissue that's vascularized, the perichondrium. So all the structures are the same, the colors are slightly different. Usually no one gets hyaline cartilage wrong, it's pretty easy. So if I have the pointer anywhere within this area, you would tell me the specific is hyaline cartilage, the general is connective tissue, okay? So connective tissue is the general, hyaline cartilage is the specific. Here's another image, again, slightly different color, but all of the structures are the same. This is elastic cartilage connective tissue. And you'll look and you, and you might immediately think, oh man, that looks like hyaline cartilage. Well, it does. It's very similar, but also very different. If you look at the ground substance that surrounds all of those chondrocytes and their lacunae, you'll see all this dark staining stuff. So it's not nearly as glassy in appearance, right? It still has little perichondrium and it still looks like little smacks, uh, the smack cereal, but the extracellular matrix, that ground substance has all this dark stuff in it and it's not nearly as glassy. Go up in high magnification, here are the chondrocytes and their lacunae, and look, what does that look like? Those little, very, those, uh, little hairs, right? Those are elastic fibers, that's why it's called elastic cartilage, right? So that ground substance has abundant, abundant elastic fibers. This makes elastic cartilage, so again, not nearly as glassy because it has all of those dark staining elastic fibers in the extracellular matrix. All the other structures are the same though. So all that, um, all that elastic connective tissue, all that, all those elastic fibers in the extracellular matrix make elastic cartilage more elastic than hyaline cartilage. But it's still pretty protective because of that gel-like extracellular matrix, that semi-rigid, semi, you know, semi-flexible, semi-solid, okay? So it makes it more elastic. Where do you find elastic connective tissue? In the outer part of your ear. Very, very flexible, but still somewhat rigid and tough. Um, the prime location for elastic connective tissue is in the epiglottis. So your epiglottis is a structure that flaps down and shuts off your larynx, which is the area that goes from, like if you're breathing in, right, air has to go through your larynx to get to the trachea, right, to get to the lungs. Well, you're, like I said before with the trachea, what's directly behind that? Your esophagus. Food has to go down your esophagus. So how do, how do we, you know, maintain food going into the esophagus, not the larynx, into our lungs, and air going to our, you know, but air being allowed down the larynx into our trachea and lungs. So this is what controls that is the epiglottis. So the epiglottis is a little flap that when you swallow, it has to close off the larynx so that when you're swallowing, any spit, liquid, or food can't go into the larynx, it will only be allowed into the esophagus, right? But when you're breathing, that epiglottis has to lift up and open up the larynx so that you can breathe in and out. Swallow, it closes. 
Breathe, it opens. Swallow, it closes. So it does that all day, every day, right? So it has to be really elastic, but also protective to make sure food can't squeak past it, right? But it has to be able to open, close, open, close, recoil back to its original size or length. Um, so this is elastic cartilage connective tissue. You find it in your epiglottis. So if I have the pointer anywhere in this area, right, and you see it like, man, that looks like hyaline cartilage, but you go in and out of fine focus and it's not really glassy. And you see lots of this junk, all of these little fibers in the extracellular matrix. The specific is elastic cartilage. The general is connective tissue. Fiber cartilage. You don't have to identify it. Um, on a microscope slide, but you should be able to tell me location and function. So you find fibrocartilage in between the bodies of the vertebrae, right? So these are, it's called intervertebral discs. So in between the bodies of the vertebrae. So your vertebrae are, you know, the bones that make up your backbone or your, you know, it houses and protects the spine. <clears throat> so your Having these intervertebral discs made up of fiber cartilage means that when you're standing up and you're walking and you're jumping up and down, you don't have bone grinding on bone in your vertebral column. You have the bones separated by this fiber cartilage, which is really good. Its function is to absorb shock, okay? Absorb shock, which makes sense when you're walking, your vertebrae are, you know, hitting one another and that fiber cartilage absorbs the shock. Um, somewhat flexible because we can move our back and we can move in different directions. You also find fiber cartilage in the pubic symphysis. So this is the, uh, the pad of fiber cartilage that connects the two pubic bones together and it's protective and it absorbs shock, but also has some movement to it. It allows some movement and that makes sense, especially for females so that the pelvic bones can somewhat shift during childbirth. Okay, so fiber cartilage. Intervertebral discs um, absorb shock primarily. Bone, or co this is compact bone. When we get to the skeletal system, you'll learn that there's another type of bone called spongy bone. But right now, all you have to be able to identify is compact bone. To me, nothing else looks like compact bone. So if I give you this on the test, you're welcome because it should be a very easy identification. Um, compact because it's very, very compacted together. Look, and it looks like you took a slice through multiple trees. You know, if you've ever seen a tree cut in cross section, and it has all the rings, kind of looks like that, right? So these, this is all compact bone. I'm not going to go into all the specifics of the structures of compact bone just yet. We'll get that to that in the skeletal system. But I do want to go ahead and point out the fact that all it, within the rings, of this unit right here. These units are called osteons. Those little bitty dark spaces, those are the actual cells. Those are the osteocytes, osteo bone site cell. So these are the osteocytes. Those are the bone cells. So few bone cells, they're not connected together, and there's abundant extracellular matrix. The extracellular matrix for compact bone is primarily calcium phosphate, right? Mineral salts which are very hard, so it's rigid. So compact bone is the hardest or the most rigid of all of the connective tissues. But it is very highly vascularized. These little areas right here at the center of each one of these um, units, this, you find blood vessels right here. So surprisingly, bone actually will heal faster than cartilage and faster than uh, tendons made up of dense regular connective tissue because it's actually, even though it's a very rigid extracellular matrix, we'll talk about all these structures, there's lots of little um, canals or channels, and it's very highly vascularized with blood vessels. So it actually heals much faster than cartilage or tendons, which is made up of dense regular connective tissue. So bone, compact bone is the specific, connective tissue is the general, uh, function, man, uh, protection of internal organs, like if you talk about the rib cage, right, the, the bones that make up the rib cage, uh, the bones that make up the vertebrae, it's protecting delicate, important organs. Um, 
structure and framework of the entire body. It allows for attachment of muscles. So bone provides attachment sites for muscles. Bone also is going to help with calcium homeostasis um, and regulation of calcium blood levels. Calcium is super important for um, muscle contraction, neurotransmitter release, and so you have to have very stable blood calcium levels. And if you're not taking in enough calcium through your diet, we can start to break down your bone to release that calcium from the extracellular matrix, that calcium phosphate. We can release some of that calcium into the blood to be used. If you take in too much calcium in your diet, we can store excess calcium in the bone, okay? So bone also plays a role in calcium storage and homeostasis. Blood. Blood is the most liquid of or fluid of the connective tissues, right? So here, this is, you can see the cells are dispersed and then there's abundant extracellular matrix. And that extracellular matrix, which we call blood plasma, is primarily water, right? So it's a very fluid connective tissue. Makes sense because blood has to be able to flow through your heart and blood vessels, okay? So it's liquid. These all these smaller cells that kind of look like they have little spaces in the center, those are not actual spaces. It's just the membrane is very thin, so it transmits light better. Um, <clears throat> these are all red blood cells, so they're much smaller. And so this, talking about each of these cell types, is talking about the function of blood. So because we have red blood cells, red blood cells are primarily responsible for transporting oxygen, right? That's a function of blood. These, and they don't have nuclei, so red blood cells are anucleate. These are white blood cells because I see a dark staining nucleus in, this, in the center of these cells. So these are white blood cells. So blood also plays a role in immunity and combating um, infections, phagocytizing unwanted debris and bacteria, and that's because of these white blood cells. Okay. The blood plasma, which is all the liquid stuff that all the you know that these cells are embedded within, the blood plasma also helps transport you know proteins and hormones and waste products and other nutrients throughout the body as well. So blood, if I have the pointer anywhere on this slide and you see all these little tiny red blood cells, and you even see, I'll make sure that you know one or two white blood cells is also in the field of view. Right? So all these little tiny cells or disc-shaped cells and then a few with nuclei, okay, this is blood. So the specific would be blood, the general would be connective tissue. Where do you find it? In the heart and in the blood vessels, so the cardiovascular system. Functions to distribute oxygen around the body, uh, immunity, combat infection, and transport, because of the plasma, transport proteins and hormones, waste products, and other nutrients to their respective sites within the body. So that's blood connective tissue.